We are live now. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Bela Bollobash. <clears throat> I am from Cambridge and Memphis, and I should like to welcome you to room six, to the second of two talks in the combinatoric section. Our speaker, Ehud Friedgut, hails from Jerusalem. In 1988, the great news in combinatorics was a theorem that Pan, Kalai, and Lineal proved on the influence of variables on Boolean functions. This KKL theorem became so well known that even a road was named after it in Israel. Um, we shall have a recorded talk, but before the, uh, Professor Fried would place this recording, he would like to say a few words to you. Thank you, Bella, for the introduction. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, at the end of my recording, I say that I'll welcome questions now, but um, I realize now that the platform we have doesn't uh, allow asking questions. However, you can send questions or upload questions through Discord on the ICM page where the, you found the link to this lecture. On the right-hand side, opposite the title, you'll see a little icon that looks like a pumpkin. And if you click on it, you can join Discord and ask me questions. And for now, just uh, I hope you'll enjoy the talk. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak at such an august occasion. I'd also like to express my deep sorrow regarding the circumstances that brought this meeting to be an online meeting, namely the aggression and violence on behalf of Russia. And um, today's talk is a talk about KKL's influence on me. And when I speak of KKL, I mean both the three people who stand behind this acronym and the famous paper, which is named after them. So here are K, K, and L. This is Jeff Kahn, Gil Kalai, and Nati Lineal. Each of them has had a great influence on me, either as advisor, collaborator, friend, mentor, and they've all greatly influenced and inspired me. And uh, today I want to speak of the famous paper, which is known as KKL, and how that has uh, shaped my uh, mathematical career. So I'm referring to the paper, The Influence of Variables on Boolean Functions. It's the 1988 Fox paper. And well, what is the influence of a variable on a Boolean function? If you have a function on the discrete cube, a Boolean function whose range is zero and one, then you can look at a certain coordinate i, and the influence of the i-th coordinate is probability that if you set all other coordinates at random to be either zero or one, the setting of the i-th coordinate determines the value of the function. So let's see some examples. You can think of this as a directional derivative if you want. So for example, in parity, all variables have influence one because if you flip the variable, you flip the, ver the parity of the vector. And this sort of hints that it's more interesting to look at the case where the function is monotone, where flipping a variable from zero to one can only flip the value of the function from zero to one and not vice versa. So let's see some monotone examples. So for example, majority, one if more than half the variables are equal to one, so there, a variable has influence only if all the other variables are precisely balanced. Let's say n is odd. In that case, the, uh, the influence is of order one over square root n, and the sum of the influences will be square root n. Here's another example where the sum of the influences is very small. It's one because there's only one variable which has any influence at all, because the function is just looking at that variable, that's called the dictator. So there, the variable you're looking at has influence one, all the rest have influence zero. Now, one can ask, can you make all the influences small simultaneously? Well, here's a try at that. This is the tribes function defined by Ben-Oren lineal. 
uh, you partition all the uh, variables into tribes where each tribe is of size log n minus log log n plus some constant. And you have k of these tribes and the function is one if at least one of the tribes votes unanimously one. So there, the, it turns out that the influence of every variable is of order log n over n. So the sum of the influences is log n. And ben Orlinial asked, is this the smallest you can get in the sense of, is it true that in every Boolean function there has to be some, if the function is balanced, the probability of the function being one is one half, is it true that you always have some variable whose influence is of order log n over n? And they conjecture that this is indeed the case. And this is what was proven in the KKL uh, paper. Indeed, uh, for every Boolean function on the cube, the maximal influence, there is some variable whose influence is at least some constant, some global constant, which doesn't depend on anything else, times well, the expectation times one minus the expectation, just a way of making sure the function is bounded away from zero and one, times log n over n. And this holds not only for functions on the discrete cube in a sequel um, where uh, KKL were joined by Burgen and Katznelson. It was proven that this holds also for functions on the continuous cube and hence on many uh, probability product spaces. And it turns out that this is a very useful and interesting theorem, but what truly made this paper revolutionary was not the result, but the techniques they used, especially the idea of using hypercontractivity, using the bonhomie beckner inequality. So let me explain a little bit about this. Um, this paper wasn't the first paper to use Fourier analysis in uh, discrete Fourier analysis in computer science or uh, combinatorics. It was one of the first papers that did this. So if you have a function on a discrete cube, you want to uh, expand it in terms of the uh, characters of Z to the N. So for every subset S of the coordinates, you have the character which just looks at the parity of the input on that uh, subset, and those are the characters, and they form a basis for the space of all functions on the cube. And when you expand the function in terms of the spaces, the coefficients are the Fourier coefficients. And when you study the KKL question, something you'd like to do is somehow get rid of the uh, high spectrum, uh, uh, the high frequency Fourier coefficients the coefficients that correspond to large sets. But just truncating is too barbaric. That's not a nice a, a operation analytically. What you can do is use the following operator, which is very useful and interesting. It's the noise operator. So the noise, you choose some a parameter epsilon between zero and one. T epsilon of F, T epsilon is the noise operator acting on F at point X is the expected value of f of y where y is chosen randomly to be an epsilon noisy version of x. So it's really averaging the value of f on spheres around uh, x. And it turns out this has a very nice a Fourier expression. The new Fourier coefficients are like the old Fourier coefficients plus a, a fine which is exponential in the size of s. And uh, what's important about this, uh, or what is useful, uh, the useful information regarding this operator is hypercontractivity. It has a smoothing effect. This is an inequality due to Beckner, Bonami, and Gross independently. If you look at the two norm of the uh, function after the operator operates on it, it's smaller than the original one plus epsilon squared norm of f so some norm which is smaller than two which means that this is a smoother function than this is which is not surprising since you're averaging on spheres and somehow using this it turns out to be extremely useful and tens of papers since then have used this idea and used this technique to give a multitude of um, results 
Uh, today I'll mention some of them which uh, appear in my papers, but there are many, many other examples. So here's a very simple application. This is the first paper I ever wrote. Uh, thresholds for graph properties. Um, look at the, consider GMP, the erdos renyi graph, and um, consider some monotone symmetric graph property. So some property which is a preserved under adding edges, that means it's monotone. Symmetric means it doesn't depend on the labeling of the edges. So for example, containing a triangle, being non-planar, uh, having more edges in the graph than in its complement. And um, Bolabash and Thomason proved the following, that if you look at the plot of the probability of, uh, the, of GNP having that property, as a function of p, uh, fix some epsilon, and you can see that you get this increasing function that looks like a step function, and you have this threshold interval where the probability of getting the property jumps from epsilon to one minus epsilon. And what Bolabash and Thomason proved is that the a gap between the top end and the bottom end of this uh, threshold interval is at most a multiplicative constant. So this brings to mind the following natural question, how large can this uh, threshold be for a monotone symmetric uh, property? And it turns out that this can be answered uh, if you just uh, simply combine two very nice and simple results. One is the Margulis-Russo lemma and the other is KKL. So how do you do this? The Margulis-Russo lemma says that the slope of this plot at a point is nothing other than the sum of the influences of the variables on the characteristic function of the property. So the slope is the sum of the influences. Now, this is a symmetric property, so all coordinates have the same influence. That influence is at least log n over n. If you have n variables, then the sum of the influences is at least log n. And therefore, the slope is at least log n, so the interval has size at most order 1 over log n. Here, I was cheating a little bit because the n I'm talking about is actually n choose 2, but we're looking at the log of it. It doesn't really matter. So uh, we proved that every balanced monotone symmetric graph property has a threshold interval of width at most c over log n, some constant uh, over log n. Actually, this isn't tight. It was later improved by Bruggen and Kalai, and recently by Kelman, Kendler, Lifshitz, Minzer, and Safra to uh, log in to the minus two. Okay, so that was one example of uh, using KKL, applying it. Now let's talk about some other results inspired by KKL. So another way of looking at the sum of the influences if you look at the function and you on the discrete cube and you look at its support, so you can connect connect uh, a subset of the cube with its characteristic function or a Boolean function with its support, and it turns out that the edge boundary, which is the set of edges going between the set and its complement, the size of that edge boundary is precisely the sum of the influences. So every edge from the set to its complement encodes a point where the function depends on the corresponding uh, coordinate. And uh, you can ask for a balance set, which is half the cube, what is the minimal edge boundary? So that's an isoparametric question. And that's not that hard to answer. The answer is the half cube. So if you take all vectors whose first coordinate is one, for example, then you get precisely two to the n minus one edges. Every point has precisely one edge leaving it. And the question is, uh, well, and the edge boundary can be as large as square root n times this. The question is, what can you say if the edge boundary is, let's say, 10 times this or 100 times this? So if the edge boundary contains, say, 100 times 2 to the n edges, what can we say? And well, one way to get a set with small uh, edge boundary is to define some function which doesn't depend on a single coordinate, but let's say only on 10 coordinates. And then you'd expect it indeed to have small edge boundary. And it turns out that this is a necessary and sufficient condition. 
that whenever you have small edge boundary, you can approximate the function by a junta. A junta is a function which depends on bounded number of coordinates. And this theorem is interesting because juntas are extremely important in combinatorics and computer science. There are countless uh, settings where you want to analyze an object or a function and do it by focusing on a small number of influential, influential coordinates and you want to show that you can neglect the rest of the coordinates. So this is what the junta theorem tells you, that if f is a balanced function, where the sum of influences are bounded by some constant k, you can epsilon approximate the function. You can find a Boolean function, which is epsilon close to the original function, which, which is the junta of bounded size, where the size of the junta in the approximating function is exponential in k over epsilon. And th that's tight. And so how do you prove this? Well, of course, if you want to find the junta, what you do is you take the influential coordinates. And you know you won't have too many influential coordinates because if they have large influence and there are a lot of them, you can't have too many of them because the sum of the influences is bounded. So you approximate your function by function depending only on the influential coordinates. But how do you show that you can neglect the non-influential ones? Well, maybe individually they each have a small influence, but maybe there are a gazillion of them and altogether their influence is too large to be neglected. Well, it turns out that when you take the non-influential uh, coordinates and you apply the KKL technique, you apply some hypercontractive estimate to their uh, a combined influence, you can show that you can indeed uh, neglect the non-influential coordinates. And that's how we prove the Junta theorem. Okay, speaking of Juntas, the extreme case is where the function depends on only one coordinate, the dictatorship. Now, that doesn't sound like a very interesting setting. However, there are a lot of very interesting theorems where the answer to a question is a dictatorship. And the two most uh, prominent examples which come to mind, one is the erdos kurado theorem, which is the fundamental theorem in extremal combinatorics, where you study an intersecting family and show that the maximal independent families, the unique maximal independent families are those that are determined by a single point. And another, if you say the word dictator in combinatorics or in game theory and social choice theory, of course, arrows and possibility theorem comes to mind. And it's quite surprising in retrospect that no one thought of connecting arrows and possibility theorem to Fourier analysis till Gil Kalai came along and had this a brilliant insight that uh, Arrow's uh, theorem has something to do with uh, Fourier analysis. In any case, what's nice about Fourier is that, well, if you look at the Fourier expansion of a dictator, it's quite simple. It's just uh, concentrated on two sets, an empty set and a singleton. But also the, the converse is true. If you have a Boolean function of degree one, meaning that its Fourier expansion is only on the empty set and the singletons, it has to be a dictator. That's easy to prove. And then you can ask yourself, is this stable? If you have a Boolean function where most of the Fourier weight is on level zero and one, and when I speak of Fourier weight, I mean the L2 squared norm of the Fourier coefficients, does that mean that the function is close to a dictator? And that's an interesting question because then if you prove some dictator result using Fourier, maybe you can prove a robustness version of that a theorem. And it turns out that there, you do have stability. This is proven by FKN. So FKN is myself and Kalai and Naor, Asaf Naor. Uh, we proved that the Boolean function with Fourier expansion concentrated mostly on the first two levels is close to a dictatorship or one minus the dictatorship. In, in any case, a function that depends on either zero or one coordinates. And um, there are a lot of related results speaking about the distribution of the Fourier spectrum. I mentioned some of them, uh, Burgen, Kendler Safra, O'Donnell, Kendler Kirchner. They all talk about Fourier functions, a, a Boolean functions whose uh, Fourier weight is on the uh, low 
side of the spectrum. Okay, let's talk a little bit about intersecting families. So Erdős Corrado, the Erdős Corrado setting is you fix some coordinate k less than n over two, and you have a family of k subsets, and they're intersecting. Every two of them have a non-empty intersection. And the Erdős Corrado theorem says that the unique maximal intersecting families are stars. You fix one element and take all sets containing it. Now, just like for random graphs, you have G and M, where M is a fixed number of edges, or you can have G and P, where P is a parameter, and when N times P is more or less M, you get a similar model. You can also look at the P version of uh, Erdős Corrado. So you take a product measure on the cube with some parameter P, and if P is less than one half, you ask, how large can an intersecting family be? Well, if you're just counting, then of course you can't have more than half the sets because you never have a set and it's a complement. But if instead of counting, you look at the measure according to P, then the unique maximal measure intersecting families are dictators. So all sets containing a fixed uh, element. And of course that has measure precisely P. And this, theorem has been proven again and again by many, many people using many, many techniques. And when I came across this, I thought perhaps you can prove it using a Fourier analysis. And my motivation for that, well, part of my motivation for that was um, that if you can do this, then using FKN, maybe you can get a stability result for this. And the answer is indeed you can. And Another uh, motivation I had was I thought maybe this could be a, a generalized for, to the t-intersecting case. So you have a family of sets, subsets of the cube, subsets of n, and every two of them have intersection of size at least t. What can you say about the measure of such a family? And here's the theorem about t-intersecting families. So for p less than one over T plus one, the unique maximal measure T intersecting families are T over ruts. So you fix T elements, take all sets containing those T elements. That, that has measure P to the T, and those are the uh, unique maximal T intersecting families. When P is greater than one over T plus one, that's no longer true. So if you want a two intersecting family and P is greater than one third, let's say you can take uh, fixed four elements and take all sets and have at least three out of those four elements and that will have a greater measure but as long as p is less than one, one over three the best you can do is fix two elements and take all sets containing them and and you also get the stability version of this and how do you prove this well just if you p was equal to one for the intersecting family you use uh, Fourier analysis, and you, you get some uh, inequality regarding the Fourier coefficients of the function. And when it's t-intersecting, you get a system of t-linear inequalities on the Fourier coefficients, and somehow you can, from that, you can prove that the function is a two over A nice thing in appeared in the original version of my paper. Later on, uh, Ryan O'Donnell suggested a way to do this without uh, using this trick. But what I used originally was uh, spectral analysis over polynomial rings. So looking at eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the function, not over the reals, but over uh, polynomial rings, that it turned out to be a very nice bookkeeping device to encode the intersections of size greater than uh, one. OK, let's continue. So this is my favorite result, uh, which I'll mention today, the Shoshimonovich conjecture considering uh, concerning triangle intersecting families. So um, there are many different uh, generalizations of Erdős Corrado to vector spaces and uh, different geometries and different groups. Uh, one of the nice uh, generalizations suggested by Vera and Miki was to put some structure on the ground set. So now the ground set is the set of all edges of the complete graph. And you look at family of subgraphs and it's triangle intersecting if the intersection of every two members contains a triangle. 
So how many subgraphs can such a family have? Well, of course, <clears throat> uh, you can't have uh, more than half the graphs because you can't have uh, both a graph and its complement. But it turns out that even proving that the number of graphs in this family is bounded away from half is uh, non-trivial. So what uh, Miki and Vera conjectured was that the unique maximal triangle intersecting families are triangle stars, one eighth of all subgraphs of the complete graph. So you fix the triangle and take all graphs containing them. And uh, the first uh, progress on this problem was by Chang, Graham, Frankel, and Shearer. Actually, I think that's where uh, Shearer's entropy lemma first appeared. And they managed to prove a bound of one quarter but eventually, uh, 34 years after this uh, problem was uh, posed, uh, together with David Ellis and Yuval Filmus, we managed to prove the conjecture that indeed the maximal triangle intersecting families are triangle-centered stars. And here's the main proof of idea. So if you had a triangle intersecting family and you fix some bipartite graph and you look at the intersection of two graphs in your family. It contains a triangle. So the intersection can't be contained in the bipartite graph, which means that those two graphs intersect somewhere in the complement of that bipartite graph. So if you look at the restriction of your family to the complement of a bipartite graph, you have an intersecting family. And that gives you, for every fixed bipartite graph, that gives you some inequality on the Fourier coefficients of the of your family or the characteristic function of your family. And for T intersecting families, we needed T inequalities here. You need many inequalities. You have to take inequalities coming from all sorts of bipartite graphs. And it turns out that what you want to do is really take a distribution over all the uh, bipartite graphs and the inequalities that come from the uh, restricting the family to their complements. And that gives you a system of inequalities on the family. And eventually, after using some massaging and some more combinatorics, you can prove what you want about the Fourier coefficients of uh, your family. And you can prove that the family is a triangle star. OK, here's another uh, interesting, seemingly unrelated question. Question about traffic lights. So you have a three color traffic light. It's either red, amber, or green. And it's controlled not by one switch, but a set of N switches, each having three positions, zero, one, or two. And what you're told is that if the switches are in a certain configuration and you change every single switch, this causes the light to change. Now, can you think of some mechanism which explains this? Uh, so apparently this was a puzzle which was popular in Hungary in the 80s and Lovas and Greenwell solved this problem and showed that the only possible explanation is that there's one switch with which rules them all that actually the the color of the traffic light depends only on a single switch and when so Irit Dinur introduced me to this problem because it's related to some interesting problems in computer science and we asked ourselves, can we prove this using a Fourier approach? So is it Fourierizable? And also, if it is, maybe we can prove stability results about this. And the answer to both these questions is yes. In a paper with uh, Noga Irit and uh, Benny Sudakov, uh, we proved this. And we had a very simple uh, uh, insight, which proved out to be quite useful in also settings, in other settings also. So instead of looking at the coloring, we just proved something about independent sets in the graph. And one of the ways to bound the size of the largest independent set in the graph is using uh, the eigenvalues of the graph and using Hoffman's bound. And what we observed, if, if the Hoffman bound is tight on the base graph, which in this case is a triangle, it's also tight on its products. So in this case, it's the n-fold te tensor product of the triangle with itself, which shows that on the graph which encodes the problem, uh, 
the only maximal independent sets are the dictators and you also have a stability result. And for this, we use Fourier analysis on product spaces. In this case, it's at three to the n. So instead of using plus minus one, use the third root of unity. And um, you also, as I mentioned, you can get stability. Okay, so this brings us to spectral analysis on other product spaces, and it turns out to be quite useful. And in particular, it's interesting to look at products of weighted graphs. And especially here's my favorite graph. This is a graph which has only two vertices and the weights are on the edges. You pick some parameter P, which is eventually going to be between zero and one half or maybe zero and one third. And you put different weights on the edges. And then you consider the tensor product, the infold tensor product of this graph with itself. And it turns out that the independent sets in this uh, graph encode the question of uh, intersecting family in the discrete cube with the skew measure uh, cor corresponding to P. And just the, the, the uh, stationary measure of the uh, random, random walk, which corresponds to these weights, is the uh, uh, product measure we're interested in. And this enables us to study uh, intersecting families. And this brings me to the uh, question which I, I find, sorry, let me go back a bit. Sorry about that. Uh, this brings me to the question which I find most surprising among the questions I'll mention today. So here's the question. Is it true that every intersecting family is essentially contained in an intersecting junta? So what do I mean by that? If you take some intersecting family in the cube, well, you can fix one coordinate and take all sets containing that element or fix a, five, a six coordinates and take all sets that have at least four out of those six coordinates. That will give you a two intersecting family. And uh, an, a way to get other intersecting families, well, you can take one of these examples I mentioned and add a little bit of noise and then take a random subset of this family. But maybe due to lack of imagination, I couldn't think of any other interesting examples of large intersecting families except just taking a junta and taking a subset of the junta. But could it be that these are the only intersecting families? This sounded too good to be true, but it turns out that it's true. So in a series of papers, the first is with Iri Dinur, second with Iri Dinur and Oded Regev, and the third with Oded Regev, we proved various variants of this uh, statement. So every inter Oh, this is interesting family, which is a typo. I meant intersecting family. Every intersecting family or every independent set in certain product graphs is contained in an intersecting junta. So for every intersecting family, I can find some junta. And looking at the elements in the junta is the entry test to your family. If you, on those elements, behave like the junta, then you can belong to the family. It's a necessary but not sufficient condition to belong to your family. So here are some key ideas of the proof. I'll just go through this very, very quickly and very, very superficially. Um, one nice idea is using noise to recover the containing junta. You see, here's an example where uh, in 0, 1, 2 to the n, I have a, a, an independent set of size 1 third, and I take a random subset of it, which is the red blob here. And if I just show you the red blob, it's hard to see that it depends on the first coordinate because you've lost most of your structure. Once you apply noise to this function, suddenly the structure becomes clear again. You get some a small part which is outside the junta, but most of what you get after applying the noise is inside the junta. And this is an important uh, idea in the proof. Another extremely central tool in this uh, set of papers is using the invariance principle using Mu, which is Mosel O'Donnell Olishkevich. This is perhaps the most important paper since KKL, 
in the theory of a, a Boolean functions. And I can't go into what the invariance principle is, but it, in this case, it, it manages, it gives us information about the correlation between a different variables on a, a Boolean function. Um, another idea we used in, in, in this paper is the importance of being biased. It's an idea that appears in uh, Irit's uh, PhD thesis, the paper with uh, Muli Safra. Once again, I won't go into what that it says. It just says that every function is a junta somewhere and for some value of P, but maybe for certain values of P, it's a trivial junta. But in this case, you can show that it's approximated by a non-trivial junta. And in the 19, in the 2017 paper with Oded, we used, uh, we uh, copied the technique from uh, Jacob Fox, uh, Fox's uh, annals paper, uh, giving improved balance on uh, a graph removal lemma. So we used this technique to prove a removal lemma that we needed. Okay, now this slide, uh, I wasn't sure where to fit it into the lecture because on one hand, it's a, a result that I really like and it's clearly uh, influenced by the KKL paper. On the other hand, thematically, it's unrelated to all the other results I'm talking about. So the result has to do with the number of copies of one hypergraph in another. So fix some hypergraph H, say a triangle, and I ask how many copies of H can one have in a graph which M, with M edges? So I don't tell you how many vertices the graph has, but I tell you how many edges the graph has. And of course, if you want a lot of triangles, you want every edge to belong to a lot of triangles. So maybe you want to take a complete graph with uh, approximately M edges. And this problem was first solved by a master's student who you may have heard of, you may have heard of, it was solved by Nogo alone in his master's thesis. So he proved that it's order of M to the power of alpha of H for, for graphs H. So Nogo took this graph H, he runs some algorithm on it and gets a function alpha of H and proves that a, a, where alpha of H is either an integer or half an integer. And he proves that the correct order is M to the power of alpha of H. Now, Quite a few years later, Jeff Kahn and I were looking at this problem and we came up with a new proof, actually two new proofs. So first of all, we observed that alpha of H is the fractional covering number of H, which is important in one of the proofs because we use a duality of linear uh, programming to look at the dual uh, function to alpha. And one of our proofs works a, also for hypergraphs. So that, that's nice. Also for hypergraphs, the answer is still the fraction cover number of H. The other proof technique works for some hypergraphs, but not for all of them. So what are these two proof techniques? One of them is entropy, which is not surprising since this is a paper with Jeff and he's uh, a grandmaster of uh, using uh, entropy in the context of giving balance on the size of combinatorial uh, objects. But the other technique and the other proof came as a surprise both to me and to Jeff. It turns out that this has to do with hypercontractivity. So actually applying Beckner's inequality, or Be the bonhomie Beckner inequality to the problem here, if you encode it properly, suddenly this uh, uh, um, function unexpectedly jumps out of the formula at you and you get another proof of, of this balance. And this, this is really something uh, quite amusing and for me also quite unexpected. Okay, let's move on to another intersecting problem, but this is not set in the discrete cube, it's set in the uh, symmetric group. So now I want to look at intersecting families of permutations. So a family of permutations is called intersecting if every two functions in the family agree on some point. So I, every two permutations in the family, when viewed as functions, agree on some point. So tau and sigma agree, 
So there's some i where tau of i is equal to sigma of i. So how large can an intersecting family of permutations be? Well, since we talked a lot about dictators, you might guess that the best you can do is to look at fixing one point or taking an i and j and looking at all functions that all, all permutations that take i to j, in which case you get an intersecting family of size n minus one factorial. And indeed, Des and Frankel in 1977 observed that the maximal size is n minus one factorial, and that's a very easy exercise. And they conjectured that the unique maximizers are dictators. And this, if you approach it as a combinatorial problem, it turns out to be surprisingly difficult. And this is, uh, you can see by how much time passed between the posing of the question and the solution. Uh, so eventually this was proven by Cameron and Ku, and soon after independently by La Rosa and Malvenuto and by Gotzel and Meager. So they proved that indeed the uh, unique maximizers are dictators. So it's co-sets of stabilizers of a point. But Des and Frankel also asked the corresponding question for t-intersecting families of permutations. So they conjectured that a t-intersecting family of permutations, so you have a family of permutations and every two of them agree on at least t points where t is some integer now greater than one, say two. Well, they conjecture that the most, you, the largest such family is of size n minus t factorial and the maximizers are what you'd guess. You fix points x1 to xt and points y1 to yt and look at the family of all permutations that take x1 to xt to y1 to yt in an ordered manner. And in this case, even proving the bound turned out to be extremely difficult. And this was still open a 33 years later. Oops, sorry. Sorry about that. So uh, in 2010, together with uh, David Ellis and Haran Pilpel, we proved that there's a Frankel conjecture that the largest uh, t intersecting families uh, uh, have size in my, of uh, permutations of size n minus t factorial. And what we used was representation theory of the symmetric group. So we imported a lot of the Fourier analysis that we were used to doing on the discrete cube in the abelian case to the non-abelian setting of the symmetric group. And we applied a lot of spectral analysis there. And what we didn't use, however, was a hypercontractive estimates. And it seemed to us that a naive, a, your naive definition of hypercontractivity doesn't work on the, a, in the symmetric group. However, uh, this is still a very lively a, a field of research. And recently, there's some beautiful work being done on isoperimetric inequalities and hyperconjectivity in the symmetric group. So it turns out that you have to find the right definitions. And it does hold, but not for any function on the symmetric group, only for global functions. And there's a beautiful uh, manuscript by Filmus, Kindler, Lifshitz, and Mincer where they deal with this. So this uh, uh, field of research is still alive and kicking and very interesting. And I'd like to conclude once again by thanking you and once again by expressing my deep sorrow regarding the uh, circumstances in which this conference is taking place. And I want to express my hope that in the close future, we'll be able to hold an ICM meeting live in Russia and Russia will once again become a beacon of mathematical excellence and we can meet there in an era of peace and human rights. So um, thank you all for attending my talk. And uh, if everything went OK and you watched this film and I'm also attending this uh, uh, session live, then I'll be happy to answer some questions now. In conclusion, let, let me thank Professor Friedgut for his most fascinating lecture.
and uh, remind you that you, you can still send questions to him. So thank you very much for, to everyone for attending this lecture. Bye, bye, bye. Thank you very much for attending.